Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, new dark energy discoveries suggest the expansion of the universe might be slowing down. A new species of filter-feeding pterosaur has been discovered in Brazil. Orcas have been documented attacking great white sharks in the Gulf of California for the first time and much more. <laughs> Our top story this week is a very exciting development from the world of dark energy research, which appears to support the hypothesis that dark energy may be evolving over time, potentially indicating that the universe's accelerating expansion is slowing down. This has some fascinating implications for the ultimate fate of our universe. Firstly though, what is dark energy anyway? In 1998, a team of astrophysicists were examining exploding supernovae across the universe, using them as kinds of distance markers to measure the cosmos. These so-called standard candles of the universe are types of exploding stars called Type 1a supernovae, and because of the fixed critical mass at which they explode, they all tend to have a pretty constant luminosity. They're all about the same brightness as each other. So this means that the dimmer they look, the further away they are from us here on Earth. In addition to the brightness of these supernovae being used to indicate their distance from us, the degree to which the light wavelengths from the supernovae are stretched, known as being redshifted, can also be used to establish how fast they are moving away from us. When these scientists were measuring the luminosity and redshift of these supernovae back in the 90s, it was thought that the expansion of the universe should be slowing down as the gravity of objects would be pulling every other object in the universe toward one another. However, that's not what they found. Instead, the further away these supernovae were, the more redshifted they were, meaning that those faraway supernovae were moving faster and faster away from us. This was an incredibly surprising discovery at the time. It showed that rather than the universe's expansion slowing down, it was, in fact, expanding at an accelerating rate. The reason behind this accelerated expansion is still one of the greatest mysteries in all of science. But physicists have proposed that something called dark energy must be acting against gravity to drive the expansion. Whatever dark energy is, it seems to be a property in the vacuum of space and makes up around 68% of all the energy in the modern day universe. Understandable then that a great deal of research has been done into attempting to figure out some of the properties of this mysterious form of energy. The Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, or DESI DESI, is one such tool that has been applied to learn more about the mystery energy. DSI, which is hosted at an observatory in Arizona, measures the effects of dark energy on the universe and maps how it has influenced the cosmos over the past 11 billion years. Some very exciting findings from DESI were released in March of this year when hints were seen that dark energy might not be a cosmological constant. It was long thought that whatever the energy is, it has a constant strength. But this evidence suggested that dark energy is withering and has weakened over the past 4.5 billion years. Although the data from DESI did not meet the so-called gold standard of evidence used to establish a new discovery in physics, it came close and definitely intrigued many people. Well, this week's new development in dark energy research is the publication of a paper by a team of researchers in Korea who have found evidence suggesting that Type 1a supernovae are not as reliable as once thought when used as distance markers for the universe. According to this new work, the brightness of the exploding stars is actually strongly affected by the age of their progenitor stars. When the researchers corrected for this bias, they discovered that the supernova data didn't match the standard cosmological model of the universe, which posits that dark energy is a constant. Instead, it matched much better with the model supported by the recent DESI data, in which dark energy weakens over time. However, while the DESI paper suggested that the universe is still expanding at an accelerating rate but will one day enter a deceleration phase, this new study 
finds that we are already in the decelerating phase. These are intriguing results, but many more tests and extensive data collection are needed to confirm or refute the findings. It's hoped that with the Vera C. Rubin Observatory in Chile now discovering tens of thousands of new supernova host galaxies, there will be much more robust data available with which to test these ideas. The universe no longer expanding at an accelerating rate has some major implications for the eventual fate of the cosmos as well. Rather than the universe undergoing an eventual heat death as everything continues to spread further and further apart, a decelerating expansion and weakening dark energy may suggest that the big crunch scenario could be the ultimate fate of everything as gravity recollapses the universe. However, that's still very speculative and would require dark energy to stop acting against gravity entirely. Some truly big ideas at play here then. It will be fascinating to see what's next for the fluctuating field of dark energy research, and if these new results are supported or not. In other news, astronomers have witnessed what can only be described as a rather large event, as the most luminous outburst from a black hole has ever been detailed in a new study published in the journal Nature. The flare was initially observed in 2018 and not paid too much attention to. Five years later, the team noticed that it was still rather bright, so took a closer look at the black hole with the WM Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Now they realised just how far away, and therefore how bright this light was. The flare is 30 times more powerful than any other before it, and it is 10 trillion times brighter than our sun, so what's responsible? Well, after ruling out possibilities like a nearby supernova or gravity warping the light to make it appear brighter, the authors of this latest study have said the bright burst of light came from a rather large star that was consumed by the black hole. As the black hole tore the star apart, its luminosity flared, creating what we were able to observe 10 billion light years away. One of the authors on the study believes that such events could become more commonplace as we start to take an ever closer and more comprehensive look at the night sky. A quick mention now to the Blue Origin launch that might have happened by the time you see this video. The company's new Glenn reusable rocket was supposed to launch NASA's Escapade spacecraft on a mission to Mars on Sunday. But bad weather and an issue with tech on the ground has delayed the launch until sometime this evening GMT today. Like SpaceX's in-service rockets, Blue Origin's new Glenn is designed to re-land the booster stage of its rocket for reuse in future missions. It has not been able to achieve this feat yet, however, but of course hopes to show off the success of this capability with this mission. The two spacecraft it's carrying is part of a NASA mission to analyse how Mars's magnetic field interacts with particles that flow around the planet, and how this energy is distributed through and out of the Martian atmosphere. Let's hope the team at Blue Origin are able to meet today's launch window so Escapade can begin its mission. Some great news for anyone about to be taken back to the height of the Roman Empire and needs to find their way around. As long as they still have access to the internet, of course. Historians have put together a resource that they've referred to as Google Maps for Roman Roads. Using modern mapping techniques alongside historical records and archaeological findings, the authors have created the most comprehensive map of the famous roads of Rome yet available. The study notes problems with previous work done on the roads of Rome, namely the fragmented nature of the research. With a map of roads across the whole empire, we now have a much more uniform map of the integral infrastructure that helped fuel the powerhouse that was the Roman imperial economy. In addition to bringing together and homogenizing existing research, the new data set that comes with this study has nearly doubled the known length of Roman roads, both thanks to its scope and the precision of this study. While a lot of work has clearly gone into making this map as accurate as possible with today's data, the study does concede that only 2.7% of Roman roads on the map are known with certainty. The release of the website has also been joined by a fabulous YouTube video which we'll put in the description. First up in the paleontology news this week, a new species of pterosaur has been discovered in Brazil. This flying reptile was uncovered from the Ramaldo Formation of Northeast Brazil, an important sequence of rocks dating to between about 111 and 108 million years ago during the early Cretaceous. 
Many species of pterosaur have been discovered in this formation, but this new species is a particularly exciting one, as it's the first example of a filter feeding pterosaur found here, named Bakirabu waridza. It's the first filter feeding pterosaur ever discovered in the tropics, possessing extremely elongated jaws densely packed with brush like rows of fine teeth, which it would use to sift through water to filter out small organisms to feed on. It belongs to the pterosaur family Tenochasmatidae, a group known for their specialised feeding adaptions, and appears to be a very close relative of Pterodaustro, another filter feeding pterosaur from Argentina. Interestingly, the density, elongation and number of teeth in Bakiribu are somewhat intermediate between the even more extreme Pterodaustro and the less specialised Tenochasma from Europe. As such, Bakiribu may represent a kind of bridge in this evolutionary gap, shedding light on how these pterosaurs became so specialised. Additionally, the fossil of Bakiribu itself was found mixed up with fish remains, suggesting that these bones had probably been consumed and then regurgitated by a large predator, leading to the mishmash condition of this pterosaur's remains. What an incredible new find for several reasons. More paleo-related news next, as another dinosaur skeleton is up for auction. This time, it's a canignathid, a kind of oviraptosaur nicknamed Spike. Discovered in 2022 in the Hell Creek Formation of South Dakota, it dates from around 66 million years ago and would have coexisted with T. rex. Spike appears to be a fairly complete skeleton, and if that exaggerated head crest is mostly genuine, then it might be something quite different from the other Canignathids known from Hell Creek, or perhaps a different morph of a known species. Either way, it would be fascinating to study, but the fact that it's being auctioned off doesn't bode well for its fate, with it seeming most likely that it will end up in a private collection unavailable to scientists for research. Spike is predicted to sell for between $4 million and $6.6 .6 million when the auction takes place on December 11th. Up next, orcas have been documented attacking great white sharks in the Gulf of California for the first time. The orcas flip the sharks upside down to induce a trance-like state called tonic immobility. Once in this paralysed state, the whales extract the sharks' nutrient-rich livers, which they share amongst themselves, and then leave the rest of the carcass behind. The hunts filmed in 2020 and 2022 show five orcas working together in perfect coordination to chase, corner, flip onto their backs and disembowel the great whites. Whilst this behaviour has been seen in South Africa, where two orcas working together target adult great whites, it is the first time it has been seen in the Gulf of California. Researchers think these orcas may be exploiting a local nursery of juvenile great whites. Whilst adult great whites usually flee when orcas appear, it would seem that young sharks haven't yet learned to recognise orcas as a threat. Ocean warming events may have pushed more juvenile sharks into the gulf, right into the orcas hunting ground. This suggests that orcas may be putting more pressure on shark populations than previously realised. The study also highlights just how intelligent and adaptable orcas are, capable of learning to hunt one of the ocean's top predators and passing that knowledge throughout their pod. Finally, for the news this year, COP30, this year's Conference of the Parties, commenced this week with representatives from around the world gathering in Brazil to discuss global goals for tackling the climate crisis. COP30 is being hosted in the city of Belém, known as the Gateway to the Amazon. This year's conference marks a particularly significant moment in global efforts to reduce the impacts of climate change, as it has been 10 years since the 2015 Parrot Climate Accords were agreed upon, where countries committed to keeping the rise in global average surface temperatures below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and ideally below 1.5 degrees. This year also represents the second cycle of the agreement in which all nations must revise their national plans for greenhouse gas emissions. It is hoped that the conference will encourage countries to submit stronger plans as the world nears the 1.5 degree threshold. Additionally, it is expected that these discussions will lead to finalising a roadmap for climate finance and support for especially vulnerable nations, as well as promoting transition away from fossil fuels. An 
encouraging development is the increased inclusion of Indigenous peoples, with representatives from various Indigenous communities involved in different aspects of the conference. As the conference progresses over these next weeks, we will be sure to keep you updated with the key developments. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at sevendos.stories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow Seven Days of Science on Instagram, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Sang Ying, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drav Strivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, Jerowen Zuedewick, John French, Joseph Ree, Josh Lambert, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Nicolaus York, Ralph Balzac, Ralph Pierpazika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Patrikas, Steve Bradshaw, Tom F. Conroy III, Timothy and Ted Rowe, Tracy Merrifield, Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>